Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, and I am the host and the co-producer of these chats with Mistress Joanne Gaddy. The fireside chats are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum in Chicago. Today, our guest is Hardy Haberman. Hi, Hardy. How are you? Hi, doing fine. How are you doing, Doug? I'm great. Thank you for being on the chats with me today. So I just wanted to uh, go ahead and start right where I normally start with all of my guests. Tell us a little bit about your childhood, because you told me you grew up bi-religious. What, what does that mean? Yeah, uh, my, my family, my mom was uh, Christian, sort of, and my dad was Jewish. And uh, when they married, my mom converted to Judaism. Uh, because that's what you had to do to marry a Jew. But uh, she brought a lot of her traditions with her. And my dad liked that. Uh, he, he was, uh, we, we sort of had a secular Christmas every year. <laughs> we okay. had a Christmas tree because he liked the Christmas tree. Uh-huh. You know, uh, and, but we had Hanukkah candles too. So it was a little of both. Uh, it was an interesting mix. And I think it gave me a nice perspective on, on things. Um, I went. I went to, to uh, temple. We were Reformed Jews. I got. Uh, I got bar mitzvahed, and uh, so that was sort of my my early years. Well, you said it gave you an interesting perspective. What perspective did it give you? Well, having relatives that were Christian and relatives that were Jewish, uh, it was it was kind of neat because it gave me a um, it gave me a chance to get a little taste of both uh, the way both cultures worked. And I say cultures because there's a difference in the, in the culture to an extent, probably more then than there is now. Uh, my grandmother on my, my father's side, uh, was, uh, she was a conservative Jew. Uh, that means as in the denomination, not her you know, political beliefs. Yes. Um, she spoke Yiddish. Uh, she was from, from Prussia and had come to this country back when there was a Prussia. <laughs> and... Uh, so she had immigrated a long time ago. Uh, she was a, definitely an old world Jew. Uh, she was a cook. She had a restaurant and cooked kosher, kosher food, uh, except she cooked bacon for my dad because my dad really liked bacon. <laughs> so we were, it was a, we used to, we used to say we, she had, when we'd have a Passover every year, we'd call it a trace Seder because it was sort of our own take on the, on the Seder. So, <laughs> and but, uh, where, where were you living at this time? I was living in Dallas. I've lived in Dallas all my life, with exception of uh, a brief time, uh, about a year and a half when I lived in Mexico City. Uh-huh. But uh, the, uh, my, my grandmother lived in Dallas, uh, and uh, my grandmother on my mom's side was a uh, more of an old Southern style woman. Uh, she was, uh, her, her husband, my, my grandfather, was, was a blacksmith. And I knew him briefly. He, he died when I was about 10, I guess. So uh, he was illiterate, functionally illiterate, but he was a, a polymath. He was very sharp mathematically. Oh. And my grandmother on my dad, my mom's side, uh, she tutored people in calculus. So she, she looked like a farm woman. She raised chickens in her backyard, but she also was very smart. So it was a neat, it was a kind of an interesting, interesting uh, duality that went on there. But in those days, how was a Jewish family received in Dallas? In Dallas, not, not a problem. Um, the Jewish community in Dallas built a lot of the city. Uh, all the stores downtown are a great number of them. The big department stores like Neiman Marcus. Uh, there was a department store called Sanger Harris uh, or Sangers, which was the Sanger Brothers, Jewish family. Um, all, it was, it, Jews were integrated into the fabric of Dallas pretty well. Oh. There was definitely uh, some prejudice, but it was not, I, I never noticed it when I was a kid. Now, we didn't live in, in the, <laughs> the area of the, of the town that people call the hood, which was sort of Preston Hollow, which is where uh, the uh, uh, Orthodox uh, synagogue was. People lived really close to that so they could you know, walk on, on the Sabbath. Okay. Uh, we, lived, we lived in uh, Northeast Dallas in a, a relatively new development uh, not too far out to be called a suburb. We were inside the city, but uh, you know, it was, it was a 1950s kind of uh, childhood. Well, as time went on, 
one of the things that you mentioned was that you were a magician. Yes, yes. So I, I, tell us about that. Well, I, I was fascinated with magic as a kid. Uh, there, was a, uh, there was a shop here in Dallas called Magic Land. And uh, I used to go down and hang out there downtown. And uh, that was where uh, a magician named Mark Wilson, who used to have a TV show here, and eventually ended up on CBS with a TV show called Magic Circus. Um, he was the guy behind the counter demonstrating magic and selling, you know, selling magic. And uh, I bought my first magic trick from him when he was on TV. And it was a cut and restored rope. And it was a great trick, but the rope got shorter every time you did it. <laughs> okay. So I, 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 you know, you, then you begin to learn what's behind magic and, it, and it's, it's good. And I liked it. Uh, it gave me confidence. Uh, I was a shy kid. I'm still pretty shy. But uh, the fact that I could do some magic tricks uh, gave me enough confidence to be, uh, to feel, you know, to feel confident. And it gave me a chance to present in front of people. And I use a lot of the techniques that I learned doing magic uh, in my presentations when I do uh, kink presentations, leather presentations, uh, just ways of dealing with an audience and working with, with a group of people and connecting with them. Can you give me an example? I used to do a lot of magic tricks that required volunteers. And so when you bring somebody up from the audience, you have to understand, you don't want to humiliate them. So you have to assure them that everything's going to be fine and you learn to work with them and you will try to get out of them genuine reactions while you're trying to get them to do what you want to do. And you have to give them the chance to, to be the star because the person from the audience should never be the butt of, butt of a joke. If anything, they should be the one who pulls the joke on you. And you can, for, for me, that's a, that's a good performance uh, the, the, that you make the, the, the volunteer the star. And uh, so that's kind of what I what I I keep with me, and and I, I do that still when I do uh, when I do presentations. Doesn't always work, but most of the time. <laughs> when was the last time you did a magic trick? Uh, you want to see one? <laughs> sure. Yes. I don't know if you remember, but Oreos uh, put out the multicolored the rainbow Oreos for the for Gay Pride. Yes. And uh, I work at my church part time and uh, I was up at the office one day and there were these cases of Oreos. And I said, what are all the Oreos doing here? And they said, well, somebody, some member of the church saw that they were trying to boycott Oreos. So in support, they went out and bought cases of them oh. and they just dumped them here. So we had Oreos all over the place. <laughs> okay. But uh, one of the things that I like about them is, you know, you get the regular Oreo. Okay. But my favorite is this kind that where it has really has the double stuffed Oreo, okay. and that's really the good, the good one, just so you know. Yes. <laughs> so aren't you something? Hey, it happens. <laughs> <laughs> and the story about the Oreos is true. There were cases of them around the church for, for weeks. I believe it. But who was Professor Tweedy Furfer? You would bring that up. Um, <laughs> Professor Tweedy Foofer. Tweedy Foofer. Oh, Foofer, okay. Professor Tweedy Foofer was a character on the Bozo Show. And um, I was that character. Uh, I had friends of mine who worked on the show. And uh, in fact, one of them was a magician friend of mine, Paul Osborne. He was the ringmaster. Okay. And uh, he knew I, I liked doing characters. And he also knew I wanted to get into television. And it was at a local TV station. Uh, at that time, it was owned by Doubleday, uh, the publisher. They were trying to get into television. So we were their flagship station. And I came down and uh, I was Professor Tweedy Foofer, which sort of a, a Viennese comic with a, you know, top hat and, you know, shaggy hair and big nose and all that kind of silliness. Okay. And, uh, oh, he had a voice. They talk like this. Oh, my goodness. You know, it was, it was a strange kind of, you know, Viennese comic thing. And uh, that was a lot of fun to do. And I did that at uh, four o'clock when the Bozo show came on. And then the rest of the day I ran camera. So I... I uh, that's when I that's when I dropped out of out of college because I actually got a job in television. It was like that's what I was going to college where I wanted to be communications, although I majored in philosophy. Go figure. And uh, but I really wanted to get into TV, and I got a chance to get into television. So I, that's what I did. Is I, I, you know, began working on the Bozo Show, and then we began doing production, and I learned how to do videotape production and switching and you know lighting and all that kind of stuff by actually doing it in in live television. How did you get into that work? Um, dumb luck. Uh, I had been, I'd always made movies when I was a kid. I made, you know, 
old Super 8 movies and uh, I, I was always interested in, in, in motion picture photography and, and directing. Uh, in fact, the first, uh, first time I really knew I, I wanted to do movies is uh, my parents took me to see the Ten Commandments. This is back in 1956, I guess. And I was just blown away. Not, not so much by the story, but by the scope of the, mo of the movie. Okay. So I wrote Cecil B. DeMille and told him what I liked about it. And he wrote me back. I wow. still have a copy. Of, I've got his letter somewhere around here. I need to frame it. It was on, it was on Paramount stationery and had his you know, signature, a little horse with a, a, a spear carrier that was his sort of sig. And uh, he said, Dear Master Haberman, which is like, you know, that's what, that's what you called kids back in those days. Yeah. Now you say, Dear Master Haberman, people think, you know, you need to be wearing one of these a and have a, you know, ha have a slave. But uh, it, it was uh, it, it was it was really exciting for me, and I'm sure he he sent back dozens of letters like that. Probably had people sign them for him, but uh, I, I I envisioned myself you know doing film work someday, and I ended up doing it. I didn't do didn't do uh, motion picture films, but I did commercials, lots and lots of commercials. Oh, okay. And uh, after I left uh, uh, the uh, Channel Thirty Nine, the television station, I went to work at Tracy Lock Advertising. And they wanted me because I knew about the video stuff. Well, tell me and, about some of the production that you did, some of the commercials or, or whatever. Uh, well, Tracy Locke, I did work on some of the uh, Doritos ads with Avery Shriver. I don't know if you remember any of those. No. Uh, he used to make a big crunch and things would fall apart or whatever. Uh, and uh, the first gig that I actually did involving that was, it turns out that the crunch sound effect that they used was an Apple crunch. Oh. And we decided that was a bad idea since that was not truth in advertising. So I got a case of Doritos and went into a recording studio and spent an afternoon crunching Doritos to get the perfect sound effect. And then we went back and dubbed it into all the commercials. So it was really a Dorito crunch. Wow. <laughs> Tell us a bit about your coming out. Well, I came out as, as gay, I guess, or bisexual or whatever. I don't remember what I told my mother at the time. But when I was 18... Um, and, uh, my dad had died, uh, that fall. And, uh, so I, I just, my mom and I were pretty close and, and I said, you know, I, I'm, I, I think, I, I think I'm gay. And after she stopped crying, cause she wasn't going to have grandkids, uh, she became very supportive. Oh, good. Um, she ended up, ended up joining the, 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 uh, the, the startup of, uh, P-Flag here in Dallas. Okay. Uh, she never did anything ha by half measure. So she jumped in with all both feet. Um, and I, I, I came out to her and I came to my family and they were all very supportive, uh, which is great. Uh, not long after I came out, I guess about two years after I came out, I began dating a woman uh, that I'd met uh, while I was working in television. And uh, we ended up living together for a couple of years. Uh, and uh, she said, you, you still like guys though, right? You really like guys. I said, yeah. I said, maybe you need your own apartment. You know, you're going to feel. So we parted ways amicably. I still know her. We still stay in contact on Facebook and everything. Oh, great. But uh, she was correct. And I got my own place. I moved downstairs in the same apartment building. You know, we stayed in touch, but it was a, it was a good decision. You know, I, I, I my affectional preference is, is for men and uh, always has been. Um, I mean, sexually, probably, I, you know, I've had sex with women. I've had sex with men. So it's, I guess that would make me technically bisexual, but I, my affectional preference is for men. So that's why I say I'm queer. That's, that's fine. <laughs> when you say your mother jumped in with both feet, how did she do that? <laughs> well, joining PFLAG or the, helping to start PFLAG in Dallas is one thing. Uh, and then she began setting me up with people. Uh, <laughs> so, which was terrible because uh, she had no idea who I, my taste and, mm -hmm. uh, Oh, the only people she knew that were gay were hairdressers and and people who were very Nelly. Uh. And she worked in advertising also. And she had a couple of designers that she tried to set me up with. And we went out on a date and we both realized this is a really bad idea. We've got to stop. we got to stop Carlita from doing this. <laughs> you know? So but uh, yeah, that was that was that was part of it. That was part of the difficult part of it. Yeah. That first year when I came out, uh, I was going away to college. I went to college at Baylor University in uh, down in Waco, uh, and it's a it's a Baptist university, which seems like a really weird place for me. But since my dad was a teacher at Baylor Dental College here in Dallas, 
when he died, I got a, I got a freebie scholarship. Oh, and we didn't have a lot of money. And it was like, well, this is a good deal. I'll do that. And so I was the Jew at Baylor. And uh, it, it was interesting because uh, I was like the class project for the, for the theological seminary. And I would get witnessed about once a week. And uh, it, it really gave me a good taste of what I didn't want in a religion. <laughs> and what is that? Um, I, I'm not big on proselytizing. And I'm definitely not big on people who want to convince me that I need to have my own personal savior. I don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't believe that there's a get out of jail free card in life. I can, I don't believe I can just say, I believe in Jesus and everything's great. I go to heaven, no matter what I did or no, whatever I do. Um, that, that is, uh, uh, uh is, uh, the kind of religion that I didn't like. Okay. So how were you introduced into the leather community? Ah, the leather community. Well, I, I got very active politically. Uh, I, I, in the uh, 70s, I, I became part of the Dallas Gay Political Caucus, which later became the Dallas Gay Alliance. Um, okay. I, I got very politically involved because I didn't like what was going on, especially in Texas and especially in Dallas. And... Uh, ended up becoming deeply involved in that. And, and you go to the board meetings or to the meetings with, uh, you know, with people I work with and the guys I was attracted to uh, were more masculine. They weren't the, you know, they, they were not the stereotypical Nelly gays. They were right. guys. And uh, when I say guys, I mean, stereotypical guys. Okay. I, that's uh, yes. I, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing broad strokes here, but uh I like that. And so uh, and they, they wore leather. They oftentimes wore leather jackets when they come to meetings. And it wasn't anything like you'd see in leather today where everybody's, you know, high leather with vests and caps and all that shit. But they, they had, you know, they, they looked different. They looked masculine. Yeah. So I asked them, where do you hang out? I never see you at the discos or the you know, dance bars. And they kind of laughed and said, well, we don't go there. We go down to this place called Sundance Kids. Okay. I said, okay. And I asked around some other friends and said, what about Sundance Kids? And they went, oh, don't go there. That's dangerous. Which immediately made me know that's where I wanted to go. <laughs> so so I, uh, I went to an Army Navy store and I bought a, 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 my first leather jacket, um, leather motorcycle jacket, you know, an Army surplus. And then uh, went and hung out in the parking lot of the Sundance Kids. At that time, uh, they had a doorman and a dress code and you had to pass the doorman before you could get in. Okay. And uh, this place was off the beaten track. It wasn't in the main, it wasn't really in the neighborhood. It was sort of adjacent to that. It was on okay. sort of a, a CD street. Uh, there was a country Western bar next to it across the parking lot. And it was a gay country Western bar, but a totally different crowd. Although I later, I found out that they went back and forth all the time. Uh -huh. um, so, and I'd been there before. So I sat in the parking lot on the country Western side and watch the door of Sundance kids and watch these guys go in and out. And these are the kind of guys I wanted to meet and, and that I wanted to have sex with. And I was still afraid to go in. And after several weeks of just showing up in the parking lot and watching, I figured it's now or never, you got to go do this. So I got out of my car I went up to the door. The doorman nodded to me and just let me right in. It's like, wow, I fooled him. So <laughs> okay. I went in, I went up to the bartender and I said, uh, so what do you have? And I said, it's like a martini up dirty with uh, two olives. And he just looked at me and said, you want a beer? I said, no, no, martini up uh, boodles if you have it and uh, dirty with two olives. And he said, trust me, you want a beer. So I took the beer and I walked over and stood by the wall and I realized he gave me the best advice I ever had coming in that bar. If I'd been standing there with my little martini glass and two olives, sipping my martini, I would look like a dilettante. And people would figure I was a tourist. Uh, I would have yeah. been right, but I'd never have anybody talk to me because like, oh, who's that fucker? And uh, instead, I just stood by the wall and watched. And I came back a couple of weeks, just kind of hang out, just stand by the wall, watch the crowd. And eventually people talked to me. And uh, I met the guy who owned the leather shop or ran the leather shop in the bar. Uh, it was it was a it was a pretty rough bar. It had uh, you know, it was the sawdust on the floor at two levels. The upper level was sawdust on the floor. And then you go down a few stairs, there'd be a lower level. And that part was, was uh, packed gravel. I mean, it was really oh. rough. <laughs> and uh, and the, there was a leather shop down there. And that's where I bought my first harness. And I bought some other stuff. And the guy would explain what goes on. And I'd say, well, what's that for? And he'd tell me about it. 
I said, well, what about this guy over here? What's his deal? And so I began getting insight just by talking to the guy in the leather shop. You know, he became sort of a friend. Okay. And uh, eventually other people, I began meeting other people and they sort of, you know, sort of let me in on what went on. And uh, that, that was a, a big, a big change. And that was sort of how I, that was sort of my, my first getting into it. Uh, the real, what I would consider the baptism, the first time I ever really played with anybody other than just having sex, <clears throat> I was, there was a, a guy uh, whose name was, uh, can I use his name? I guess I can, uh, was Master Hadley. Uh, I was over at Hadley's apartment and he was in the bedroom having sex with a guy that I knew and I kind of tagged along because this was the 70s and that's what you did. And I was talking with Slave One and looking at this photo album that was on their coffee table. Now, you know, contrary to what people believe, Leathermen don't live in leather houses. Um, his, his apartment was very high gay. It was very, you know, just the right little objet all over the place. Very wow. nicely decorated. Okay. And, you know, track lighting, the whole thing. And uh, so I'm looking at this photo album, and it was of, of an event called Inferno. And at the time, I had never been or known, knew about Inferno. Well, that's an event put on by the Chicago Hellfire Club every year, yes. sort of their yearly run yes. uh, at a secret location, uh, essentially a resort, but it's a secret location. And uh, there are pictures of people doing stuff that I didn't even know you could do. Such as? Um, well, there was a, one, I remember one picture, there was a guy totally mummified with just a little holes for his... And, and he was like mummified and hanging upside down, like face down from this suspension rig. I'm going, can you do that? And oh yeah, oh really, yeah. And while, while I'm talking to him, I've got this, there's a chrome ball on the table, you know, like an objet of some kind, oh. some kind of playing with this. And I say, what, what is this? And he said, oh, that goes in my ass. <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> he said, yeah, you want to see? Within about 30 minutes, I was pushing this ball in and out of his ass. And he was popping it out and putting it in, and my hand went in there, and it was like that was the first time I ever fisted anybody. Wow! And like this is really cool, and so that was sort of the the way I got into it, so to speak. And and at that time, of course, in in the seventies, for some reason, fisting was a big thing. You know, things go through phases. Sure. Fisting was what it was about, and so that was a big deal. Uh, it was years later that I actually really got a chance to experience it from the receiver end, but <laughs> that was, that was my first time doing it. Uh, so it was, it was, it was cool. It was very cool and uh, eye opening. But taking a brief step back, you said you were the moment that you were told it was a dangerous place to go. What about it excited you? Because clearly there was something there that defied whatever the other people were warning you about well when they said dangerous i uh, i i knew they didn't mean like you're getting killed mm -hmm. <clears throat> but they meant it was a rough bar oh okay and and i like the idea of masculine men and the guys who told me it was dangerous are people that were definitely not in masculine oh men. okay so but the perceived danger was part of the fun uh, you know the whole leather thing is i think a lot of the reason uh that, that the leather community started wearing leather, like when the motorcycle club started back after the war, after the world war, um, they wore leather and they rode motorcycles. Well, you wear leather when you ride motorcycles, but also people don't fuck with you. You know, yeah. if you look tough and you're walking, you walk into a, a town or somewhere into a store and you're in a motorcycle jacket and you got one of these hats on and you look you and the dark and the glasses and the whole thing, people just go, Oh, stay the fuck away from him, which is perfect. Yeah, because they didn't want people to screw with them. It's sort of protection, you know. It's leather armor, yes. and uh, I think that's that's part of the reason why that was so attractive. So that's that's kind of where that's kind of where I, that all came about, and that's why I say that's why I like the uh, the danger aspect of it. I like the roughness of it. Yes, I want to take a quick step back so that we don't overlook something here that I think is important, and that was the first March on Washington in 1979. Yep. Tell us about that. Um, there was, I, we got a, I was involved with the uh, Dallas Gay Alliance at the time. And uh, some friends of mine were brought these flyers and they said, Hey, look, Cleve Jones and, and uh, these guys on the West coast are going to do this March in Washington. It's going to be the biggest party in the world. We're going to have a million queers in Washington. It's going to be fantastic. 
And I thought, well, this sounds like a lot of fun and it's something we need to do. Yes. It was, you know, I was, I was very involved in being active. So I got involved in the organizing of that from the, for the Dallas contingent of it, Texas contingent. And uh, uh, in fact, we had a hotline that you could call and that phone was in my house, was in oh. my apartment. It had an answering machine on it because, you know, that was high tech at that time. Yeah. And you'd call and it would give you the information about the march and what to be and where to be and all that. So I would update that. And that's what I took care of. I took care of the hotline. And then we'd go out and we'd sell buttons every weekend. And uh, another friend of mine, uh, she was a designer and uh, she designed the logos that we used for Dallas. And we printed up these little sheets with the logo on it. And I got a button maker and she got a button maker and we'd sit there in the evenings and make buttons, you know, homemade button maker. Okay. And uh, we'd go sell the buttons for two or three bucks or whatever. And that would help fund the, the work that we were doing for March on Washington. And we chartered uh, an, another friend who was involved, had a, uh, a travel bureau. He chartered a, a 727 or 737, 727 at that time. And uh, we filled it. And we were headed to Washington, D.C. And we had the reservations at the Holiday Inn in downtown D.C. And the weather fucked us up. We couldn't get there. And we had to stop over in Houston. Because we couldn't go back to Dallas because the weather came in. And we ended up, and we couldn't get into Washington because it was socked in. So we ended up stopping in Houston. And we stayed at the airport hotel in Houston and took over the club upstairs and made it into a disco for the night. And all the flight attendants came up and partied with us. Uh. <laughs> And then the next day we took off from Houston. And of course, since we all knew the, the shtick, we all did the, the, the oh, yeah. flight seat attendants demo. seat demo and the, you know, here the exits over the wings. You know, we played along with that. It was, it was great. So the whole plane, the, the Dallas delegation showed up on force the first day of the March. And uh, uh, it was, it was, it was very cool. I've still got a few pictures of it. Um, it was, it was a lot of fun, but it was also very poignant in that, it, it, you know, being in the nation's capital, it does affect you. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, if you, if you don't, if you don't go there often and you go there just once in a while, it's, it's overwhelming. It's beautiful. Yes. It feels like government, you know, but it also makes you feel very American and it feels very representative and, and to be on the mall and to march up to the, the Washington monument where they had a, a, a stage set up and, to hear all these speakers, uh, Allen Ginsberg spoke, you know, oh, wow. uh, uh, Robin Tyler was one of the organizers. She's a uh, lesbian comedian. She was fantastic. Uh, a lot of Tom Robinson band played all these, these people who were just, you know, sort of nascent out uh, LGBT people um, were there. And it was such a wonderful bonding experience. We went and we did a lobby day on Monday with our state representatives and uh, but just being out in force and having the news media see us. Yes. Was very affirming. Um, I went back uh, in 1990, the March on Washington in 1990. Okay. No, 1990. When was it? The last 1980, 1995, I think was the last. No, it was later than that. I, well, there was a big one in 2000. 2000. That was the one. Yeah. I was there for when, that. Yeah. I was there in 2000. Uh, I went back for that and, and it felt a lot of the same way. There were leather contingents then, yeah. uh, in, in the first March on Washington, there really wasn't a leather contingent, although I wore my leather jacket and we all hung out, but it was, you know, too hot to wear a lot of leather. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at that time, uh, leather was sort of like, eh, we don't want to scare the, the muggles, you know, don't, don't, we, we're trying to look like everybody else. But by the time 2000 came around, we all marched under the leather flag and wore our leather and the whole deal. Uh, uh, in fact, I got to meet John Oliver. He was interviewing people around that time. So that was one of the cool things about it. But, but yeah, it, 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 those, those marches were, uh, they really energize you. And if yes. people had never done it, it was energizing. And when I came back from the first March on Washington, I got asked to speak places all over the place at different clubs because they want to hear what it was about. And when you tell them yeah. about it, it was hard to put it into words, <clears throat> but the energy that you got from that was so affirming yes, uh, that it made it, it made it okay. And, and it made it, it, it let you know that you were doing something. We didn't get enough done, but at least something got done. And uh, that was a, a big deal. In fact, CBS did a, did a thing called uh, <clears throat> gay politics, gay power, I think. 
and uh, they showed scenes from the March on Washington. It was not a particularly good uh, documentary as far as putting good light on the LGBT community because it was a little bit scary for you know the straight community, but it it at least it gave us visibility. And when people are visible, they're harder to ignore. Yes, that's why I wear leather when I go to my church. You know, when you're when you're visible, people can't pretend you're not there. Yes, and so you 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 have to be out. And I've always been out. Uh, I have once I came out, I didn't really hide much. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I you know there's a little wishy washiness in there, but most of the time I've been completely out. <clears throat> Let's go back to SM a little bit, though. You said you experienced your first fisting session by putting a ball up somebody's ass. But how did that evolve for you into other activities? I, I, I began to learn a little bit about uh, what people enjoyed. And I, I like to bring I, I like seeing people have a peak experience. You know, I, I like to get people to that place where they're just going. And the animal energy, that, that primal energy, especially with fisting or with flogging or with anything that's cathartic uh, is, is just uh, attractive to me. And I love it. And uh, I love hearing the moans and the sounds. That's all, you know, aphrodisiac for me. You know, it's not, I never took a class. I did later, I took classes, but I never took a class on how to do something. Oh. You learned by, you learned by doing it. Uh, and you learn by watching others. And I watched a lot. Uh, the, there were several people who I really enjoyed watching. Just was like, wow, that's really cool. And there was a bar uh, down near where uh, Sundance Kids used to be uh, called The Brick. And it had a, a, they did a thing called the Living Art Show every year. And the great thing about it was people would do these wonderful uh, bondage sculptures. And one of the things that David did is he had a guy mummified hanging up above the bar on his rack. And so there's just this mummy up there. You can see him breathing. And there was a little red light that kept going on and off. And I said, David, what is the red light? Is that like a breath monitor? He said, no, that's a TENS unit in his ass. And it was like, okay, this is good. <laughs> wow. So this guy was having a scene up there. Yeah. And just there. And he was monitoring him and he gave him water and checked on him. But it was uh, it was one of those one of those things like ah, and unless somebody knew what was going on, they'd never know that there was a scene going on with an electric butt plug in the sky. Uh, they would just think, oh, he's just up there, and that's his heartbeat or something. So, wow, that, wow. those are the kind of things I learned, and and I, I loved that kind of uh, the deviousness of it and the in ingenuity of it, and yeah. you know, part of the fun of, of SM is the toys. Yes. And I love collecting toys, so that's great. What's your favorite and, toy? <clears throat> uh, the, the one that's, that I use the most, that, that consistent, is that my floggers. Oh, okay. Uh, I've got some floggers that I've had for 30 years, I guess. Uh, one was made by a friend of mine and his wife. They started making floggers. And then the other one was made by Jeanette Hartwood back when she was still actually making the floggers. And they both made them for me. They've got these marvelous... Uh, Turks had knots on them. They're weighted just right. They balance perfectly. They've got like 27, 28 falls. Oh. And uh, when I hang them on my waist, they come down just to the top of my boot. You know, they're, 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 they're meant for, they're meant for the way I, way I play. How do you play? I learned to flog just doing it and watching other people do it. Uh, and I really got a chance to where I really found a style uh, I was at Inferno one year, and this is probably 25 years ago. And uh, Brian Dawson was there, and he was he, he taught a, a brief little class on flogging, and that was an uh, that was an eye opener for me again, because the way he flogged was totally different than me. Oh, he worked from the side, so that when you know he stood, if, if the person is standing here, he stood here, so his swing brought it across the back all the trails went across the back at once. So it's this great thuddy slap. And uh, I tried to learn it and I felt so clumsy because I was used to standing from behind and doing the whole you know, direct straight at. I learned it after, with a lot of persistence. In fact, I almost gave up. And another friend said, no, you got to keep working at this. It's not easy. And I got the style down and he does this kind of over the head wind up. So you can get this wonderful hard swing. 
and and that's the style that's the way i flog but what i do is i try to start off slow bring people to a place where they really enjoy it uh you know i'll hold the tresses and slap them against their back to get them used to it and i build up very slowly and i do it sensually and i i whisper in their ears and i talk dirty to them and i'll stroke their back and caress them and then i'll mix this soft caressing with a wham and build up again and try to get them to the point where they're just writhing in in sensation i don't think of it as pain i think of it as intense sensation and uh and and we, we play this game we go up and down and up and down so that when they're done they're exhausted but they're happy and they've had a great time and they're they're sexually excited and i am i'm exhausted and i'm happy we're both high and and that's that's the way i like to play i, I like to make sure that they're in a place i want them to be uh, and at the same time, I can monitor and make sure they're going the right way they want to go. I, I used to use regular safe words, uh, you know, red, green, whatever. Sure. But I found it works better if I tell them, as long as we're having fun, you call me sir. If you need to talk, you call me Hardy. Okay. And we can continue the scene and we can talk and things can change. And that's why I want you to have that freedom to tell me, you know, while we're, while we're playing. So I'll... You know, play for a while and I'll whisper in their ear, is that getting you excited, boy? Or is that, you know, is that making you wet, girl? And if they go, yes, sir, it's like, okay, we're on the right track. If they go hardy, it's like, yes. And we talk. Okay. And I change and adapt to whatever's going on. The, the problem with red to me, and, and I, I, I don't say don't play with safe words. I say you play the way you want to play. But the problem with like red and green is it's very black and white. And it just puts an end to things. And, mm -hmm. and you may want to change something. You just don't want it to stop. Yes. You know, it's like, I'm enjoying this, but you're hitting the one spot there. It's just really fucking making me crazy. Can you go a little lower or can you do this? Or can you, you know, whatever, but we need to have that freedom to communicate. So yes. I think any scene is continual negotiation and communication through the whole scene. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, and you, you need to be able to do that. And, and I, I try to give people permission to continue to negotiate and to talk to me and to continue to let me know how things are going. Cause otherwise I'm flying blind. I know nothing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, but you said when you were coming out and into the scene that people were raunchier then. Oh what yeah. Do you mean by that? <laughs> well, a lot of piss play, a lot of piss, <laughs> you know, it was a, if you got a new pair of boots, all your club brothers would come around and piss on your boots. Um, if you got a new motorcycle, it got initiated by being pissed on. Oh my. Um, <laughs> if you if you and and like at places like the Sundance Kids, it had a dirt floor. So you know that went on in the bar. Not anymore, but it did then. Uh there were people that were that were human toilets and they really loved piss. And so when you go to the bathroom, there'd be the trough, and then there'd be a guy sitting on his knees over here with his mouth open. And it was like, okay. Uh yeah, and that to me was really, really hot you know uh, uh armpits you know i like the smell of you know nuzzling somebody's armpit is just a complete turn on to me uh and that's a little raunchier than some people like yeah um yeah you know it's it's i've never been into into scat or the brown hanky or any of that but there was a lot more of that that went on now a lot of that changed of course with with aids and hiv and we took precautions and we didn't have fluid exchange and so forth and uh, and that was the good thing, right thing to do. I just I like I like it a little more edgy. <laughs> but in speaking of HIV, you must have seen that devastate the community. Talk with us a little bit about that. Uh, here, it hit the leather community really hard and really fast. The first people I knew that were that came down with it were in the leather community, hmm. or were leathermen. We really weren't a community; we we're sort of a subculture at the time. Yes, and. Uh, I remember uh, seeing a guy that I hadn't seen in, in, in months and I saw him on the street and he was always one of these people that just looked hunky and, you know, virile. And he had a cane and he looked right. He looked just rail thin mm. and was hobbling down the street and he had blotches on him and it scared the shit out. Of me. He had, mm. he had capacity sarcoma. He was, he had had wasting. He got, he had he got it bad. I mean, he had the, the you know, this is before any treatments were going on yeah but it didn't even look like the person that i knew i was too scared to come up and even talk to him i feel ashamed of that now 
mm -hmm. uh, because it was like seeing a specter and that and uh it scared me uh i had i had met a boy at that time and we had we're in a relationship and we sort of moved out to north dallas and hid away you know we kind of hid out from the leather scene um which is unfortunate but i know that uh a lot of leather men were sick and the medical system was not prepared for it uh the nurses and the nursing staff most of them not all of them but most of them were scared of it yes and so they would do things like there'd be so much in fact i knew people who were in the in the hospital in very poor shape and they wouldn't even bring the food in the door to them they put it outside the door okay. so we had to go and take it into them and a lot of our lesbian friends stepped up yes. uh, the leather dykes stepped up and they began to take care of people in the hospital when the hospitals wouldn't now yeah. luckily we got the hospital pretty educated pretty fast and that changed but at first it was it was ugly um, a friend of mine who i worked with in television who was also a leather man who was one of the leather men who was sort of my mentors i had lost touch with him and when i came he i heard he was in the hospital so i went to visit him and he was this big virile guy, kind of a little bit overweight, you know, kind of a bear. Uh, he looked, he looked like a child. I didn't even recognize him. And he said, it's me. And it's like, oh my God, it's you. And it's so we, you know, we hugged and, and I, I hung out with him. Uh, he had lost his lover uh, about, a, about six months before. And uh, that's the last time I saw him. And he looked okay then. And when I saw him this time, he was like totally gaunt and 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 died within another couple of within another couple of months. It was uh, I, I don't want to go through that again. <laughs> I feel like we've kind of been through it again with COVID. Yes, I've had at least three or four people that I know or I'm close to who've died of COVID, and uh, it 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 feels too way too familiar. Yes, and it makes me makes me want to scream that's one reason i'm so glad that we got rid of the he who shall not be named who was occupying the white house uh, mm -hmm. he might as well have been reagan you know reagan wouldn't even say the word aids for years anyway aside yeah. from that <laughs> but you mentioned mentoring a moment ago what is your what are your thoughts on mentoring in the community uh it feels artificial to me oh okay uh, I like I like informal mentoring where somebody will say, I really like what you do. Can you show me how to do that? Yeah. Or somebody wants to become your friend and hang out with you and they want to see how you play. They don't have any interest other than they just want to kind of get the lay of the land and know the ropes. Uh, I, I'm always happy to do that. Um, I, I guess I don't like the, the the commitment of taking on formal mentorship. So I just fear of commitment on my part. <laughs> I, I have I'm in a committed relationship. That's as much commitment as I need. And, you know, I'm committed to a lot of things. And that's one of the things I don't really have time for. But, but I, I, I enjoy doing it. Um, I don't know what people would learn from me, but I'm, I'm always glad when they're flattered when they say, hey, I want to see how you do this or what you do or tell me about, you know, how you feel about things like that. So that's, you know, that's. Well, like you said, mentoring doesn't have to be something formal. If you're able to teach someone something that constitutes mentoring. Yeah. And, and I do that. I do, you know, I do classes for different subjects in PDSM and leather. And, uh, and I think that's, that's where I get my mentorship, you know, kicks from is doing that. It just feels more natural to me. And that's, yeah. that's just me. But taking a, a bit of a, a step to the side here, uh, when we prepared for this chat, you said that you've been in sobriety since 1986. So Tell us about that. Uh, well, I, uh, uh, I, I was uh, doing my taxes and uh, was coming up. I, I didn't have enough money to pay my taxes. I'm going, why not? And so I looked at my bank account and I see all these $100 withdrawals. $100, $100, $100, $100. Said, oh, I bought cocaine with that. I bought cocaine with that. I bought cocaine with that. Bought cocaine oh, with no. That. Oh, that was all cocaine. And then I added it up for the year and I came up with $35,000 of cocaine. And it's like, I think I have a problem. My gosh. Now I didn't do it all because we had fabulous parties. We mm. did have fabulous parties and uh, there would always be cocaine and there would always be lots of liquor. You know, we'd have the big promotional size bottles and uh, we'd go through all that on a weekend and, uh, and be, the next week would be, you know, get ready for another one. 
Um, I call that the AbFab days. <laughs> so um, I, I stopped using, I had actually stopped using cocaine and, and alcohol when uh, my, uh, about two months after my ex sobered up. Okay. That was in March. He actually, he sobered up after, shortly after a Halloween party we had. And in March, I gave everything up just because in solidarity and uh, I felt better. And then I got into cocaine anonymous for a while and went to narcotics anonymous for a while. Uh, but Al-Anon was still my primary per- program, but th- it's all the same steps. Yes. And, and, and it really worked. And that was in 86. And uh, uh, it, 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 it works if you work it, you know, the, the, they say that, and it's true. And uh, I didn't, had no idea I was an addict until I started looking at the behaviors and the, the bank account. And it's like, yeah. I think there's something wrong here. You know, ah, that explains why when I stopped using cocaine, I felt so shitty because I was going through withdrawal Yeah, <laughs> and didn't even realize it. And so I'm lucky in that respect. Um, uh, but I, and then I gave up uh, cigarettes about three years later, uh, which helped a great deal. And the only thing I had left was coffee, which is okay. Now I drink decaf because of my heart. So I've like got nothing except, oh. you know, placebo coffee and, <laughs> but it's okay. You know? yes. uh, and I, and I, 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 I am very happy about it. Uh, my ex and I, didn't part ways on the best of terms but the one thing i'm grateful for is that i got into recovery because of him and uh good that that's you know it's part of my story and will always be part of my story so but i would be remiss <laughs> if i didn't bring up your writing oh Tell okay. us a little bit about that um yeah i i write uh the first uh, I've, I've always written but the first book i wrote was uh essentially pulled from collection of my uh collections of my uh, uh, pass out to my handouts for my classes, my CBG classes. And I combined that with stories of stuff that I had done. And I changed the names, you know, so it's the innocent look yes. less, less guilty. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, I wrote, a, I was encouraged by uh, a guy who owned a leather shop here in town, a guy named Johnny Gray. He said, you should do a book. So I got in touch with Greenery Press, who did a lot of the kink books at the time. And I submitted a manuscript to her, to uh, Janet Hardy, who was a publisher. And she said, this is kind of unlegible. I want to get a, a editor with you. And I said, okay. So I signed a publishing contract and I got an editor and we put together Family Jewels, which was the first book. Uh, and it's still what Johnny told me. He said, you know, you write a kink book about CBT or a how-to book, it'll sell forever. And I never expected to make any money on it. And I really haven't made much money on it, but the book is still in print. And still sells. Great. And every year I get a little royalty check from the people that ended up buying Green Repress. Uh, it's not much, but, you know, it's nice to be able to say, yeah, yeah I'm a professional author. Look, here's my royalty check. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I wrote uh, another book, More Family Jewels, and then one called Playing with Pain, which is more about pain scenes, which is what I really like. And then uh, I had a lot of people say, well, what about your, how do you, how do you, reconcile being christian with what you do and so i wrote a book called soul of a second skin it's not new that physical experiences lead to a spiritual enlightenment i mean the cathars in the back in the ancient gaul uh were a a a sect of christians who did uh, you know self-flagellation and that's where you get the word uh, cathartic is from their work you know uh, the the flagellants, the penitents who, you know, uh, do the stations of the cross as a as a, yes. a, a spiritual experience, they're doing physical things which bring them to a heightened emotional state. In the in the far eastern cultures, in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, wherever, they do these same kinds of things. They do physical experiences that lead to a spiritual enlightenment, and that worked for me because that's exactly what I was having. Uh, that's what was going on with me. Uh, from a top or a bottom standpoint, it doesn't matter. You still get to the same place. Yeah. And, and so that I thought, wow, isn't that neat? I'm having a spiritual experience. You know, I know a lot of people who get that, but they feel bad about it because they think, how could God approve this? This is bad. You know, this internalized kinkophobia. 
And, and to me, I don't think that works for me. Uh, I try to, to you know, I, I talk to people, uh, I talk about compartmentalizing my life. I had, you know, here's my, my political life and here's my sexual life and here's my, you know, my, my work life and here's this. And if you try to keep them all separate, uh, eventually you're going to, you're going to screw up and things are going to get mixed up. Oh. And, you know, it's like trying to tell a lie. You're telling a lie to yourself. And so I said, I can embrace who I am. And so that to me is, 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 is important. And that's why I wrote that book is I wanted to let other people know that. And it, luckily it, it was very well accepted. And uh, then I wrote the, the, the last one that I wrote was a meditations book for leather people. And, uh, and it's got me really, people really like it. Well, before we conclude, what's the biggest misconception about you? <laughs> uh, that I'm very gregarious and outgoing. You're not? No, I'm incredibly shy. Uh, like I said, I used magic as a kid to overcome the shyness. Uh, if you put me in a room of people and I don't know anybody, I'll leave that room without knowing anybody. <laughs> wow. I, I'm not very gregarious. Uh, luckily, uh, my reputation precedes me in some cases, and I've ended up meeting a lot of people. So I can always cluster with somebody that I know, and then we can go, you know, spread from there. But yeah, I'm, I'm really very shy. In fact, uh, a lot of people think that I have this crazy, wild, you know, dungeon sex life all the time. And uh, I tell them, wish. <laughs> I tell them, you know, the boy and I, we've got a cat, we've got a house, we're couch potatoes. We watch Star Trek, you know, we're geeks, uh, we're nothing like what you'd expect. And uh, it's not nearly as romantic, but, you know, don't just don't tell anybody that. <laughs> well, Hardy Haberman, I would like to thank you for an amazing fireside chat. It's been, it's been great fun. Thank you.